Certainly. Hare Krishna. So I'm happy to be here once again with all of you. And I'll speak on the 17.15 in the Bhagavad Gita. So this is Anudvega Karam Vakyam Satyam Priyahitam Chayat Swadhyaya Bhisanam Chayva Vanmayam Tapa Uchyate So Krishna says that austerity of speech means to speak in a way that does not agitate people's minds. And you should speak truthfully but speak pleasingly. Satyam Priyahitam Chayat Speak truthfully, speak pleasingly and speak beneficially. So I'll talk about, the theme of the talk will be <clears throat> The truth that lights the path is not as inspiring as the truth that warms the heart. When we are cold and we are dark, at that time we need a light, a path to go ahead from where we are. But if you are cold, we also need warmth where we are. So there's a light, there's the truth that lights the way. This is this is not right, this is right. Move forwards. And there's a truth that warms the heart, that encourages and connects with people where they are. And especially in today's world, it is the truth that warms the heart which counts much more than the truth that lights the way. I'll talk about this in three broad parts. One is, I'll talk about the contemporary intellectual ethos, today's world, then I'll talk from some scriptural examples and analysis, and then I'll talk about how we can apply this in our lives. One of the biggest casualties in today's world which is characterized as a postmodern world the one of the biggest casualties is the idea of truth with a capital t people say there are truths with a small t you have your truth i have my truth they have their truth what they mean by this is with the respect to life's ultimate questions who are we actually what is life meant for people feel that this is a matter of subject to understanding you have your faith you have your belief system i have my belief system you don't encroach on my space i won't encroach on your space and then what actually is the truth people feel that the truth in itself is unknowable Historically speaking, there have been three broad ages, we could say. The pre-modern times, the modern times and the post-modern times. In the pre-modern times, whether it is India or the West, scripture was considered to be the authority. The Vedas in India, the, uh, <coughs> the Bible in the Western world, that, that is the authority. That was the pre-modern times. But as the modern times began, in the 17th, 18th centuries onwards, basically with the advent of science, science became the authority. And scripture, whenever it was found to be illogical or unscientific, then it was rejected. And science became the arbiter of truth. But in the postmodern times, which has started roughly from the late 1960s, but in essence they started with the dropping of the atom bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Till that time, people thought that science is a source of good for everyone. And people thought that science will, the paradise that religion has promised in another world, science will provide that paradise in this world. And science through technology did improve a lot of things. But it became clear that technology is not necessarily the source of good. It can actually be the source of destruction and destruction at a scale far bigger than what was possible in the past. 
Now, of course, people do use technology and people do use science. But people in general don't think that technology is always a source of good. And nor do people think that science is always the source of truth. Within science also, as science developed into quantum physics and relativity, things became very complicated. And science itself is ridden with many contradictory ideas, which can't be reconciled. So I'm not going to go into the technicalities of science. But the point I'm making here is that in the postmodern times, neither scripture nor science is accepted as an authority. What is accepted as an authority is experience. If something makes sense to me, if something makes me feel good, if I experience some benefit by doing something, then that is what I will do. And the result of this is the mod, the postmodern times are, you could say, philosophically unphilosophical. <laughs> <laughs> what that means is that through philosophical argument, they say no philosophy can ever be true. If you, whichever philosophy is there, there is some fault in it. You can find fault with this, fault with that, fault with that. And thus, the philosophy is that there is no philosophy. And there's no philosophy which can actually give the truth. So then everybody has to live with certain assumptions in life, certain worldviews, whether we accept a particular worldview or not, whether we consciously have analyzed the worldview that we accept or not. We all have some worldview with which we live. So for most people, whatever works for them is what they live by. Now, what do we mean by work? That means it works at a practical level in terms of helping us to get, get things done. Science and technology helps us in that. And it helps us at a psychological level, emotional level. It helps us to feel good. It helps us to give some, some kind of uh, peace and meaning to our life. So now, here is where the truth that warms the heart that is very important. Since I started coming to America, I got to talk with many Ishta Prabhupada disciples. Because in India, we don't have so many Prabhupada disciples who are there. But America, there are many. Especially in Florida and Alachua. So when I talk with them, uh, and many of them have had interactions with Prabhupada. And the the most memorable aspects of Srila Prabhupada that they remember is not the logic of Prabhupada by which Prabhupada refuted some misconceptions. It is the personal interactions that Prabhupada had. It is the sweetness of the affection that Srila Prabhupada showed them. It is, Prabhupada says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Updesha Amrit, that the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by the sixfold exchanges among the devotees. Guhiyam Akhyati Prachyati That when we share our hearts and we hear others share their heart. Dati Prati Grahanati We give gifts and we receive gifts. Bhumte Bhojayate Chaiva We take prasadam and we offer prasadam and we receive prasadam. So basically these exchanges is what touched people's hearts. Prabhupada did give the truth, but what attracted people to him was not that he showed the way, but that he warmed the heart. Now both are important, no doubt. But even if we know that okay, this is the way, Krishna is life's ultimate goal and this is the path. For most people, even for many devotees, Krishna appears to be a very distant reality. And what inspires people to practice any form of spirituality is not how glorious the ultimate destination is. That is one aspect. But it is also how it helps them in the here and now. And that's why many people, when they come to any spiritual path, there are different reasons why they come. Most people come for a sense of community. They want a broader place to belong to. 
bigger than the family. The families are mostly uh, nuclear families with not many members and even sometimes those in today's world even the nucleus is split. <laughs> and there are electrons and neutrons just electrons pro there are protons and neutrons just moving around <laughs> it's unfortunate but so people come for a bigger sense of a sense of community and when people come to spirituality at that time not many people really seriously consider the philosophy Yes, people do want to make have some sense of things. So I was at an interfaith meeting in Australia, and even in America, currently the fastest growing religion is Buddhism. And Buddhism has started growing in the in Australia also, and primarily it is growing in the form of mindfulness, mindfulness meditation. Now it's interesting that Buddhism is very determinedly a philosophical. That is Buddha, he just did not speak much philosophy. Once he was asked that, is the body the same as the soul? He remained silent. Is the body different from the soul? He remained silent. So what is the relationship between the body and the soul? He remained silent. The person walked away. And his disciple asked him, why didn't you answer this question? He said that he was not ready to receive the answer. So whatever I would have spoken would simply have reinforced his illusion. So he said that just forget ultimate questions. Focus on your practical life. Focus on improving your practical life, here and now. And for many people, if we consider three modes, Tamas, Rajas and Sattva, through breathing exercises, through some kind of meditation or some object, people can relatively speaking rise to Sattva. And when they rise to Sattva, they feel a sense of clarity, they feel a sense of tranquility, a sense of illumination, luminosity in their lives. And that is much better than life in Rajas and Tamas. Mm. And for them, that is the shred of truth. That it's, it's just a small shred of truth that they have experienced. But that is what attracts them. Most of our scriptures, if we see, are spoken with a presumption of a certain level in the audience. The Bhagavatam is spoken to Parikshit Maharaj, who is already a very devout king. He is living a devoted life of responsibility as a king. And he is told, now even forget that life of devoted responsibility in the world and focus on exclusively devoting yourself to the Lord. So basically, the scriptures raise some people from Sattva to Shuddha Sattva. That's the primary target of scripture. Hmm. If we consider, say, the Chaitanya Charitamrata and the Chaitanya Bhagavat, they say when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu descended to the world, there was so much degradation in the world. Ah, interesting. What is Chaitanya Bhagavat's definition of degradation? If you see when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came, at that time India was under Islamic rule. And many of the Islamic rulers were quite heavily persecutors. But Chaitanya Bhagavat does not talk about that. Oh, these Muslims were so destroying so many temples and that is our degraded condition. It says, what is the degraded condition? That People studied the Bhagavatam, but did not glorify Bhakti. That people bathed in the Ganga, but did not chant the names of Narayan, names of Krishna. That people performed religious worship, but only of goddesses like Shashti, not of Krishna. Now today if we talk about society is degraded, if you meet somebody who is worshipping 
worshipping some goddess or somebody is actually studying the Bhagavatam. A very special person, you would say. Isn't it? <laughs> so, the Chaitanya Bhagavat is speaking at a level where it is talking about how people are performing dharma but they are not performing bhakti, shuddha bhakti. So from the level of dharma to raise them to the level of bhakti. That is the target of the Bhagavat. And that is the target of even the Chaitanya Bhagavat and Chaitanya Charita Amrita also. Now this does not mean that sattva is not important. As compared to tamas and rajas, sattva is actually very important. One simple way to understand these three modes, sattva, rajas and tamas is that in tamas, basically there is action and there is contemplation. We think internally and we act externally. So in rajas, there is first action and then contemplation. Do it and then hey, should I have done it, should I have not done it. In sattva, there is first contemplation and then action. In tamas, there is neither contemplation nor action, there is simply delusion. So for example, say some people just sit for hours playing some video games, watching some TV. Not even thinking really what they are doing, nor are they doing anything. That is tamas. Or people just drink and are lost in their own world. That is tamas. Just running around doing things without really thinking about it. So that is rajas. So some people speak to express their thoughts. And some people speak to discover their thoughts. <laughs> 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 they speak, hey, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> so, that speaking impulsively and then regretting what you have spoken, that is the characteristic of Rajas. Now, in today's world, if somebody is heavily in Rajas or Tamas, that is what we would consider as degraded. And somebody is Sattva, we would consider a very good person. Because the world has changed enormously. And for some, so when the Bhagavatam talks about giving up sattva to rise to Shuddha sattva, that does not mean sattva is bad. It just means if sattva becomes a competitor of Shuddha sattva, then sattva has to be given up. When we, in sattva, we can perceive material reality properly. In Shuddha sattva, we can perceive transcendental reality also properly. With this understanding, for people who are in Rajas and Tamas, if something helps them to rise to Sattva, then that is a step ahead for them. And if while speaking about Krishna, we condemn that Sattva, this is all temporary. This is all useless. This is all illusion. Then, essentially, what is the little shred of truth that they have? Something that they have experienced as truth. Something that, that gives them, that helps them to make some sense of life. We are ripping it away from them. We might be giving them something better, but they have not experienced it to be better. So, for example, say it's cold outside and there is some person who is who is trembling and shivering and they have they are wearing rags and we want to give them a nice good dress to wear wool cloth but if first we go to them and rip off the cloth that they are wearing they may have no idea that we they may have no faith in us that we are going to give them a better cloth if we rip off the cloth that they are wearing that is what is shielding them from the freezing cold. Even if it is shielding them imperfectly, they will not let it go. It is when we give them the fresh cloth and they may wear it on top of their own cloth. It may not match, it may not fit, it may just be a, it may be a messy thing. But till they get the faith, okay, this cloth is for me. This dress is for me and this gives me better warmth. 
then at their pace they will rediscard the old growth so similarly for people in today's world whatever world view they have adopted whatever spiritual path they are following whatever they are whatever kind of practice they are doing that give that may be that may be giving them some good feeling something they experience by that and when they experience that that is that is the basis of their conviction and if we reject that if we condemn that we say that is wrong this is right that the truth that lights the way it is right but it's like pulling off their cloth covering them they will they will fight and not give it up but if we offer them a better world view without necessarily challenging or criticizing their current understanding now their current understanding may be something and this is a different understanding how they reconcile it that is something which they will have to figure out and over a period of time they will realize okay this doesn't make sense so much this makes much better sense they will adopt it so we need to focus on the truth that warms the heart that means the truth that helps people feel connected and the truth that helps people experience a better life a better emotion in their hearts but if something helps them to come to goodness as i said earlier people are one of the biggest things that people look for when they come to a spiritual path is a sense of connectedness a sense of relationship a sense of community and if someone comes to krishna and if they find the krishna devotees are very judgmental this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong and people just get very disheartened but if we just yes this is how this is what we do this is how we do it we explain things to people and people will take it up at their pace and when this happens they take it up not because somebody has convinced them but rather they have themselves accepted it they have experienced it I was at the I was in New Zealand and I was speaking with a I did I did a program over there in the bhakti lounge and after that uh, there are people who come with various different kinds of practices so there was a person who came he says I have been practicing spirituality for the last 20 years I asked him okay what is your spiritual practice so he said i have been practicing aroma therapy <laughs> so i said okay how is that spiritual he says aromas are spiritual aromas raise your consciousness to the spiritual level and there are different aromas which create different consciousness within me and he's talking elaborately about this and that and that now at one level you could say aromas are just physical sensations they smells now what how much effect it is going to have and there are some scientific studies which indicate that certain aromas may pacify the mind certain aromas may help people in certain situations so i was just hearing with him talking with him and then i without addressing his practice i said that actually there is a three level reality body mind and soul and what helps us to realize our spirituality to help us understand that we are the soul that is spiritual and what makes us feel good that can be spiritual but that can also be psychological because feelings come from the soul all consciousness comes from the soul but presently most of our feelings are experienced at the level of the mind so for most people anything that feels good to them that's what they think is spiritual and because of that they just can't figure out that there might be something higher to life so when i explain to him this difference between the mind and the soul that 
what what feels good to the mind it can appear spiritual but it may not actually address the soul then he started asking okay if that is the case then what actually addresses the soul then i started talking about chanting i talked about krishna talked about transcendental reality and as we we had a good talk and at the end of it he felt it's like a new universe is opened for me and then i then he uh, then i talked about within aromas in the anandavan chimpo there's a description of the fragrance of the body of krishna then i told him about that I opened the book and read it out to him he says this is transcendental aromatherapy he <laughs> 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 loved it <laughs> so after that the devotees were telling me that i was there for about a week but i was in touch with the devotees there they said that he is now started coming regularly to the lounge and he is asking more and more questions becoming more and more committed and in his own way his aroma therapy was what was making him feel peaceful it was making him feel calm making him feel a little better and instead of dismissing that we acknowledge that and we take people ahead. so this is what actually when we challenge what people believe at that time it goes into a confrontational mode and once it goes into confrontational mode people just can't make sense of things is this right is this right is that right nobody knows how will people decide when they have no idea in the ramayana when vibhishan surrenders to ram at that time he has three options before him before he surrenders to ram he has tried his best to persuade ravan give up sita and return and give up sita and you will be safe but ravan rejects him knocks off his crown condemns him so he meets with his faithful four ministers and he talks with them and he says right now i have three options before me one is that either i can create i can instigate a insurrection a coup in lanka and overthrow ram and then take the throne of lanka and hand over sita and thus i can avoid this war and i can save the citizens of lanka and the soldiers of lanka from being destroyed second he said i can just abandon everything and go to the himalayas renounce the world of politics uh, i can say i tried my best but ram didn't listen to me what can i do but he said in this first option he said actually I don't have enough influence to create a coup against Ravana because every Ravan Ravana on one side had subjugated everyone by fear because he was so powerful and so demoniac on the other side he had also subjugated everyone by giving them prosperity so people didn't have much complaints with him and even they had complained they would not voice it secondly said I am a member of the royal family and i have a responsibility to the kingdom i cannot just renounce the kingdom and go away like this so he said the only third option for me now is that i go on the side of Ra- ram and tell him that his enmity is not against the rakshasa dynasty and the entire rakshasa dynasty is not against him it is only some part of the rakshasa dynasty there are rakshasas who are supporting him who are on his side and his enmity is only with ravana and those rakshasas who support ravana and he consulted his ministers they also agreed he said this is the only feasible course of action for him now when he went like this it was actually a very uh, brave decision to take because he is cutting off his connection with everyone connected with his family and he would be considered 
not just as somebody who abandons the family but who betrays the family abandons means just to go away betray means to actually work against them and ravan was so cold hearted that eventually when the war started every night after the war would end they would have war throughout the day and the war would end at that time ram would stay awake late into the night to perform the last rites of all the monkeys who would be slain in the battlefield and at the end of the day during the night ravana would tell his demons that all the demons who have been who had died just pick up their bodies and throw it far into the ocean why he said if the, by the next morning there are no rakshasa corpses seen on the battlefield the vanaras will think that we did not kill anyone yesterday and they'll become discouraged thinking that their fighting is ineffective so ravana exhibited the original use and throw culture <laughs> use the warriors for use the rakshas fighting for his cause and if they die literally throw them away so he was so brutal that even those who fought for him if they died he would cast them away and if they if somebody betrayed such a person and the vibhishan was his own brother if if he saw vibhishan the traitor if somehow he would catch vibhishan the kind of kind of agony atrocity torment torture that he would inflict on vibhishan would be unimaginable so it was extremely brave decision for vibhishan to come to ram and when he came to ram at that time there were uh, the vanaras they all saw him hovering above he had a giant he had a, he was also a, he was also a warrior so he had a giant rakshasa body seeing him uh, hovering above the ram uh, the army of ram they all became alarmed and they started discussing who is this why is he come here all the vibhishan announces the intention they say i have i am ravana's brother i have come to surrender to ram but the vanaras did not believe him he said maybe he's a spy how can somebody give up one's own brother and come like this if today he has given up his brother and come what is the guarantee tomorrow he will not give us up and go back to his brother so like that they were discussing and only hanuman at that time he said if i look at his face i see no no sus- nothing suspicious on his face i see the transparency on his face and then ram said yes if he has come to surrender to me then i will accept his surrender and he said sakrudeva prapannoyam tavasmiti achate he said even once if somebody surrenders to me saying i am yours avayam sarada tasmai tam etad vartam mama my vow is that i will give them security forever fearlessness forever and then the interesting thing is even without vibhishan's asking ram calls the monkey priest to bring water from the ocean and he coronates vibhishan as the king of lanka when ravana hears this he is outraged he is a, he is outraged how dare what it implies is that ram is so confident that ravana is going to die <laughs> and Ra- ram conveys by this to vibhishan that he has no intention to destroy lanka he has no intention to even annex lanka his only intention is to remove the demoniac ruler of lanka and hand over the kingdom of lanka to another ruler of the same dynasty so thus he reassures vibhishan so both by his declaration 
and by his action ram wins the heart of vibhishan vibhishan of course is devoted to ram the, when the leela happens in this world at that time there are different characters they have a eternal relationship but at the same time their relationship is established at a particular time in the world so in the mahabharat it is in the swayamvar of draupadi that krishna meets arjuna for the first time and actually krishna comes to arjuna and he says introduces himself i am krishna mm -hmm. so that is the first meeting over there in that particular leela so like that vibhishan is devoted to ram but the meeting for the first time happens in a particular situation and at that time ram wins the heart of vibhishan first by his declaration that i will protect anyone who surrenders to me he says even if ravan comes and surrenders to me i will i will give him protection also now then he does the action of coronating ram coronating vibhishan as the king now when ravan hears he is outraged but then he just tries to is dismiss the whole thing he says you know one cow uh, one popper has declared another popper as the king what is the value of it ek kangal ne dusre kangal ko raja bana diya so he tried to dismiss it away but the point is actually when vibhishan comes ram wins the heart of vibhishan already at one level vibhishan is devoted to ram but that is from the transcendental perspective from this time's perspective from the, the manifested leela's perspective ram by his actions he wins the heart of vibhishan he doesn't try to explain to vibhishan in any way how his cause is right or ravana is wrong that is all understood but the key thing over there is to establish the connection and once that connection is established then vibhishan becomes the key person at several occasions especially in bringing down indrajit and finally in bringing down ravana himself so lakshman brings down indrajit and ram brings down ravana so for us when we are practicing bhakti when we are trying to share krishna bhakti with others the focus has to be on connecting people i'll conclude with two three incidents from shri prabhupada's life of how it is the truth that warms the heart that is what attracts people prabhupad was at one place in america and it was like a, it was a, a double apartment so on one side the devotees were living on the other side an old lady was living and that old lady was complaining a lot of this do this these hippies they do such a loud noise and she had com complained to the local government local authority municipal authorities and they were they were restricted the devotees from doing kirtans and for devotees often there is a there is a very ready temptation to demonize anyone who opposes devotion mm. Mm. so to demonize anyone who opposes devotion so already when prabhupad came to that place they were so prabhupad this woman is a demon <laughs> she opposes kirtans <laughs> therefore she is a demon and the devotee had gone for a morning walk with Pra prabhupad and prabhupad came back instead of going to their side of the house prabhupad just went to her side of the house prabhupad knocked on the door and he started talking with her and for almost 15 20 minutes prabhupad was just talking typical old people talk with her how are you where are your children what are they doing are they married this that how is your health and the devotees were waiting when the prabhupad talk about krishna chanting hari krishna you are not the body you are the soul <laughs> prabhupad did not speak anything like that and then finally prabhupad just uh, greeted her wished her well and came back and when he was coming back the devotees had a big question mark on their face <laughs> what and prabhupad just look at them and said old people sometimes become lonely and when they are lonely they become irritable and 
that's all Prabhupada, Prabhupada left. And after Prabhupada left, that old lady came to meet the Jodhis. Swami was such a nice person. When is he going to come back? I enjoyed the talk with him. And then she actually withdrew the complaint against the, against the devotees. And the devotees were able to practice bhakti very nicely. So Prabhupada brought this lady closer to Krishna without speaking even one word about Krishna. Or at least he stopped her from going further away from Krishna by stopping Krishna Kirtan just by his human kindness. Not so much by his. She didn't appreciate Prabhupada as a saintly person. This is a nice old man. So we have to focus on connecting with people. And to the extent we can connect with people, to that extent they will connect with Krishna through us. Now, of course, Prabhupada was strong and cutting also. But it is according to time, place, circumstance. There is uh, the book of Srila Prabhupada, Perfect Questions, Perfect Answers. So the person with whom the interview happens, and that the discussion happens, that's Bob Cohen. He is a senior disciple of Prabhupada, now Brahma Tirtha Prabhu. So he meets Prabhupada and he tells Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I'm a vegetarian. Now at that time, you know, now vegan is, becoming vegan is quite cool. In 1960s, it was quite extraordinary for somebody on their own to become vegetarian. And Prabhupada says, so what? Even monkeys are vegetarian. <laughs> monkeys are vegetarian. He said, yeah, really? Monkeys are also vegetarian. Because the real thing is to offer your food to Krishna. Now this is one aspect of Prabhupada. This is a well-known tennis player, Peter Barwash. He met Prabhupada and Prabhupada told him that you're already well-known. He says, use your fame to raise people to a higher consciousness. So he, based on his interaction with Prabhupada, he focused on giving a generic spiritual message by which people at least give up meat eating. At least give up that gross sinful activity. And that's what Prabhupada encouraged him to do. Because he had a mass influence and with that mass influence he could raise people's consciousness from where they are to one level up. So for somebody who can rise from being vegetarian to becoming a devotee of Krishna, at that time we do need to speak strongly. But Prabhupada already by his conversation with Brahma Tirtha Prabhu, Bob Cohen at that time, he already developed a personal connection. And when Prabhupada spoke strongly to him, that did not make him feel rejected. That made him, it was like a jolt, but it illuminated him. But when somebody with whom we have no personal connection, at that time we condemn what they are doing, we, we criticize what they are doing, we just feel rejected. It is only when people feel that we are their well-wishers that people will let our words challenge their beliefs till people are convinced people are not convinced that we are their well wishers they will see our words through their present beliefs say somebody starts comes to us and starts speaking very nicely to us and the first question will be, what does he want from me? He <laughs> said, why is he speaking so nicely? He must be wanting something from me. Now, if somebody has always been nice to us, cordial, polite, sweet, then we understand that this person cares for me. That's why this person is so nice with me. And then we don't suspect at that time. So basically, we are here, this person is here. And it between us and them is their belief system, is their worldview. That may be right, that may be wrong. But when we challenge that belief system, what happens is because that is their belief system, they feel threatened by it. It is only when they are convinced that we are our well-wishers, then they will be ready to re-examine their belief system. Otherwise, instead of re-examining their belief system, they will examine us through their belief system. <laughs> and they will simply this person is so judgmental, so narrow-minded. So, self-righteous and they will just reject us. 
So Prabhupada, according to Desha Kalapatra, according to time, place, circumstance, guides whom to elevate how. And that is vital for us even in our relationships. I was with a, one, one devotee who has worked for a long time with a very well-known senior devotee. I was talking with him about his experiences. And he was saying, with, while working with that senior devotee, he said that he's a wonderful person to admire from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, you could say that is his subjective experience. But that what it means is somebody we may know from a distance and we may know oh, this person is a brilliant speaker, this person is, can speak very nicely, gives very, has a lot of knowledge, brilliant analysis, whatever. But sometimes at a personal level, if people can't connect with them so well, then they don't feel so illuminated, so inspired. So, actually, yes, we do need to give the truth that shows people the way. But what will people, what will make people go along the way is not just the understanding that this is the truth. Because they can always come up with reasons why this may not be the truth. But what will inspire people to move forwards is if the truth warms their heart, it makes them feel good, it makes them feel connected. And then they can become elevated. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is a book which offers enlightenment. But before that and after that, in the beginning and in the end, Krishna covers this message of enlightenment, not covers, you could say, uh, envelops the message of enlightenment with encouragement. That encouragement comes by his expression of affection. He says, Krishna tells Arjuna that, I love you. That's why I'm speaking this message to you. This most confidential knowledge I am speaking to you because I love you. I am determined to love you. One Acharya translates this as. Drudam. Drudam means determined. Ishta means very dear. You are, I am determined to love you. No matter what you do. Ishto sime drudamiti. Tato vakshami tam. Therefore, for your benefit, I am speaking this. Shruname paramam vacha. Whatever I have spoken, these are the supreme words. So when Arjuna hears this, then that connects with his heart. He's of course at one level, he's already accepted Krishna. He's eternally devotee of Krishna and is already convinced about Krishna's message. But the way Krishna presents it is, he has a message of enlightenment, but there is also a message of personal warmth and connection. I care for you. I, I love you. And that's why I want you to understand this. And the last word that Arjuna speak, Krishna speaks. Oh Arjuna, have you heard attentively? Kachi deita shutam partha to yekagrena chetasa. Kachi da jnana sammoha pranashta stedhananjaya. So that Acharya is explained over there. When Krishna is asking Arjuna that, have you heard attentively? Has your illusion been dispelled? Or the implication there is, Krishna is telling Arjuna that, in case you have not heard anything attentively, I am ready to repeat it again. And not just a part, he says, if you want, I will repeat the whole Bhagavad Gita to you again. <laughs> so he is so concerned that he understand. And is this concern that is what has to be evident when we are sharing Krishna's message. And if the truth that we share warms people's hearts, then that will inspire them to take the path that is lit. And then they will move closer to Krishna. Our capacity to warm others' heart is tiny. But we have to do our tiny part. And then when they connect with Krishna, Krishna's wisdom, Krishna's love will warm their heart like nothing else. So we... I just meant to be a small trigger. It's like when we want to light a candle. First, we light a, light a matchstick. And a matchstick has a small light. And if we have a big lamp, which is lit to be lit. So first we light that small matchstick, small little flame. And then we take it close to the lamp. And once the lamp is lit, the whole hole room can get lit. 
but the lamp cannot be lit unless the matchstick is lit first so our lighting the matchstick is like our warming people's heart with our personal connection and then when people practice bhakti that is their connection with krishna and that is like the big lamp being lit and then if their life becomes clear for them and they move forward steadily towards krishna so i'll summarize i spoke on the theme of the truth that lights the way is not as important as the truth that warms the heart i started by talking about how truth is a big casualty in today's postmodern world because people feel that how do you know something is true in the past people accepted scripture as authority as post pre modern times modern times people accepted science as authority in post modern times people are skeptical about science capacity to give the truth or our technology capacity to do good always they use science and technology but they don't rely exclusively on it so the only source of truth people feel is experience and because different people's experience is different so they say there's only truth with a small t your truth my truth everybody else is true. everybody different people feel truth like that so in such a situation when we are to share the truths of bhakti we have to do it in a very uh, sensitive way and for people our most of our bhakti scriptures focus on raising people from goodness to transcendence for a king who is devotedly doing his kingdom now focus on just exclusively remembering krishna for people who are already doing vedic dharma now practice para bhakti so because of this goodness sometimes becomes trivialized in our scriptures but there are many other scriptures which talk about the importance of goodness of sattva and for in today's world most people are in rajas and tamas and if they rise to goodness it makes them feel good it makes them feel peaceful and that's why they take it up even if it doesn't make it doesn't make a lot of sense philosophically to them it just feels good to them so today's intellectual ethos is philosophically a philosophical and philosophical don't bother about any philosophy and that's how buddhism is popular although it doesn't have much philosophy but because it offers practices that help people to come to to become more mindful to come to sattva they feel good and if we challenge people's truth then it is like a person in the cold wearing rags and we pull away their rags they will resist vehemently but when we offer them a warm cloth irrespective of whatever rags they have we just tell them the, share the truth of bhakti with them and they start experiencing it this really warms me much better then they become more open to understanding and then they will eventually give up that rag when they see this is this warms me much more so for us connecting with people at a human level so that they can connect with krishna at a spiritual level that is the first step i talked about how prabhupada himself did that even without speaking about krishna he brought people closer to krishna at times sometimes he said vegetarianism is not enough sometimes he says vegetarianism is important so i talked about how ram he won the heart of vishnu by both his loving declaration and his loving action of coronating vishnu uh, uh, as the king and for us when we are practicing bhakti or we are sharing bhakti we have to focus on not just showing the what is the right thing to people but also warming their heart by our warmth by our human connection that is like lighting the matchstick and then from that matchstick the huge flame of krishna's love of krishna's wisdom will illumine their hearts and their lives thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna, hare krishna. any questions or comments so why is there negative connotation associated with vision there are that way i have not seen many people naming their child as ravan also is it that that's like, like out and out out, out, out and out demon okay yes. i appreciate this point see the two things over here in general most people 
like to see things in terms of black and white. That is the normal human tendency. This is right, this is wrong. And wherever shades of grey come up, people are uncomfortable. And when those shades of grey come up, it's very, it's the relatively easy thing to do is just to put it in the white category or the black category. And where will you put them? That, that is determined by the cultural ethos of the particular people who are there. Now, in general, in India, if you consider there are two levels of dharma, there is aparadharma and there is paradharma. Aparadharma is material religiosity. That means the idea that we should take care of a material responsibility properly, we should do some religious activities so that we can better take care of our material responsibility. So, for example, many people think, many Indians in general think that their dharmic responsibility is to take care of their family, make sure that their children are educated, to make sure their children are well settled in family life. And this is important, no doubt. And in the Western world, people are not even doing that. So definitely it's important. But at the same time, this itself is not spiritual. Prabhupada says that even animals show affection to their loved ones. And it is natural and necessary, but it is not spiritual. So. Uh, many of Prabhupada's Hindi lectures are on the theme of rising from Aparadharma to Paradharma. And in that context, he speaks about how Aparadharma, material curiosity is inadequate. But most people are at the level of Aparadharma. And therefore, when somebody gives up Aparadharma to do Paradharma, people can't accept it so easily. That's why from the point of view of Paradharma, from transcendental religion, Paradharma means just wholeheartedly devote yourself to the Supreme Lord. So if both Para and Apara can go together, then people are happy. But if Apara has to be given up for Para, people become very uncomfortable. People, so Vibhishan, when he gives up his brother for serving Ram, that people find questionable. Hanuman, he is serving Ram, is wonderful. He's Ram. Hanuman is a wonderful bhakta. If somebody practices bhakti in family life, in a pious society, it's considered very good, oh, you are bhakta also. But if somebody renounces the world and becomes a brahmacharya sannyasi to practice bhakti, he says, why are you giving up all this? There is often quite vehement opposition to it. So, so what happens? In general, in today's world, it is in, in a general pious society, Paradharma is considered to be important, but not so important that you give up a Paradharma. At the cost of Paradharma. At the cost of Paradharma. And because Vibhishan gave up the Paradharma, so he is seen negatively. And although he surrendered to Ram, but the fact that he fought against Ravana, that is held against him. Now in the Mahabharata also, there is one of the Kaurava brothers, Yutsu who fights against the Pandava, uh, Kauravas. But he is not a very significant factor. He does not know any inside secrets. He is not a big warrior. So that is why there is not much negative association with him. But Vibhishan, because he was very close, he was one of the brothers of Ravan, and he knew the inside secrets, which he gave to uh, Ram and Lakshman. So that is why he is considered sometimes a, like a betrayer. But it was not that he bit, I have, as I mentioned, as I read in the book on the Ramayana, so that elaborately one essay analyzes whether Bhishan was a betrayer of his race or whether he was a protector of his race. Actually, it was Ravan who betrayed his race by uh, just for, by, he's a king meant to protect his citizens, but just for his, because of his lust for someone, he was ready to endanger all the citizens and all his warriors and he fought a war which is destructive. He knew that he did not have protection from humans and monkeys. He knew he had already experienced the power of Ram when, you know, when in Janasthan Ram single-handedly destroyed his entire battalion of 40,000 warriors. So he knew and yet he courted, he 
abducted Sita and courted that war. So it was Ravan who betrayed his own kingdom and his own citizens. And betraying a betrayer is not betrayal. So what Vibhishan did was that Ravana who had abdicated his own royal duty of protecting his citizens for his own lust. Vibhishan by betraying such a person actually acted for the protection of his citizens. Can you answer your question? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The 15th verse you mentioned, you talk about austerity and Bhagavad Gita, austerity and finance, Sri Gopal mentions few times. What is the difference between austerity and penance? Okay. What is the difference between austerity and penance? Generally, Prabhupada groups them together. But technically speaking, penance is usually done for purifying oneself of the, rec of the consequences of some wrongdoings. Austerity is done in general for purification. So, for example, somebody fasts on Ekadashi. That is a austerity. Now, Prabhupada may use, Prabhupada may use the word together, austerity and penance, but technically if you want to go, penance would be, say, somebody does something wrong. And as an atonement for that, they say, I'm going to fast for one day. Or I'm not going to take one meal for one day, whatever. So that is an atonement. So penance is used more in terms of atonement. So generally when we say that, so penance would be technically would be translated as prayaschit or paschatap. That will be the direction of penance, of the connotation of that word. Whereas austerity is more of tapasya. So when, when, Parikshit Maharaj decides to take this vow of seven days to fast unto death. He does it in a mood of prayashit. He says, now I, I committed a big mistake. So it's a penance he's taking. Of course, we could say that he is not only doing the penance of fasting. He's also hearing about Krishna continuously. So generally, if say Hiranyakashipu performs, performs uh, tapasya to worship uh, Brahma and get some benedictions. So there we would use the word austerity, not so much penance. Penance is where we have done some wrongdoing and we want to ourselves do some difficult activity by which we voluntarily accept pain as a consequence for that wrongdoing. And thus we uh, hope to avoid the other consequence of the wrongdoing. It's like somebody commits a crime and they voluntarily surrender to the police. That's like doing penance. But austerity is any discipline that we follow for some positive goal that we want to achieve. Does it answer your question? But penance also purifies self. Oh, of course, both purif purification happens through both. Thank you. Yes, we'll come back to you. Yeah. So, Prabhu, uh, my question is uh, like you gave in one of the examples, Sri Prabhupada meeting and talking to that old person, or develop a good relationship like that. So similarly, sometimes I try to get a good relationship and then they start asking us to come to their like Sri Guru Dutta program or something like that. They send me like two, three times invitation, I did not go. So I'm very confused probably like in the sense uh, hmm. like the real practical situation. That's true. If you look at it, right, there are like so many temples are there, like especially in the place where we stay in Edison itself, there are like 10, 12 temples within like two, three miles radius and thousands of people are going there. How to, like, you know, like, we know we have the highest philosophy and things like that. It sometimes becomes very difficult to make friends with them. Yeah. Way I need some That's true, okay. So, at a practical level, if we make friends with people, then they expect us to come to their social or religious functions. Or eat something at their home. They might yeah, eat something at their homes, yeah. So, this is something which is according to timeless circumstance. Bhakti no Thakur says in Chaitanya Shikshamrath, there can be three kinds of festivals. He said there are devotional festivals, religious festivals, and social festivals. This is just my words to use. But what he says is the festivals concerned centered on Krishna, which a Vaishnava wholeheartedly participates. But there may be festivals connected with they connect with Devtas. If it's a part of the social convention to celebrate the festival, then a Vaishnava may go there. The devotee does not necessarily 
worship the devta the same way the devta worshipers are doing. We see the devta as a representative of Krishna. But it's required for social convention, that's okay. And if there are some social festivals in general, say we could have Independence Day in America or Independence Day or Republic Day of India or whatever. Now at that time, if the national anthem is being sung and say we, we don't offer our respects, it will just create a disruption. So, na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sanginam joshet sarva karmani vidwan utta samacha 3.26 says don't disturb the minds of unintelligent people even if they are attached. Just don't tell them. In the fourth canto, Vishwanath Thakur in the Bhagavatam purport says that when Prithu Maharaj is a king, he was a pure devotee but a king was expected to perform some grand sacrifices and in those grand sacrifices, ahuti, offerings are to be offered even to the devtas. So he said externally he would go along and chant the mantras which would satisfy, which are meant for the devtas but internally he was seeing those devtas as devotees of the Lord and he was chanting those mantras ultimately as meant for the Lord. So externally sometimes we just go along with convention. Now how much to do that, that will vary from situation to situation. We can't make a rigid line for this. And in general, as this is one devotee, where was this? In Australia somewhere, he had this experience. He said that they had some, he was invited, it is in Canada. He was invited to some Kirtan. And that was a, that was a program in his neighborhood about some, about some Baba. So that was the program and they said we are doing that Kirtan. So he said, what can I do over there? So he went there. Now he's a good singer, his son is a good Mudanga player. And there he went and they were all doing Kirtan and he says, they asked him to sing. If they came to know that he's a good singer, he says, you sing. And he started singing Hare Krishna. And he sang so nicely, his son started playing Mudanga. And for all of them, they just, they were doing Sai Kirtan earlier, they started Hare Krishna Kirtan. And then different people started doing different, different Krishna bhajans. And it just became a complete Krishna glorification program. So, in general, people, when they come for a religious occasion, most Indians are not very, most Indians are, there, there is what is called as orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is, doxy is belief or philosophy and praxi is practice, what do you practice? So Indians are, many Indians are very religious but they are not very particular about the object of their religious worship. Many times people will come to a temple, they will close their eyes and pray and they will go away without even thinking who is there on the altar. Somebody is on the altar, let's pray to him. <laughs> It's like that. So therefore, most people don't have any objection to worshipping Krishna as God. They might be doing their own kirtan. If you start Krishna, they won't mind it. It's only when we say only Krishna is God. That is where they have a problem. But it is not that that is something which we have to tell right in the beginning. Even the scriptures itself, there are the worship of the devatas that is given. And there are people at a particular level who can take up a particular kind of worship. So we don't have to be, um, we don't have to be in that mode of rejecting others when they are doing other things. Now specifically, how much we can get involved in what? That we have to see our services, our schedule, uh, schedules, and then we can plan accordingly. But we don't have to have make it a principle that you can't do this. There was even with respect to eating food. In general, if we tell properly that this is the, I don't take onion garlic or whatever, people don't mind it so much. But in public, if we just reject or condemn their food, that is where the problem comes up. So we can just take some food which is in harmony with our principles. There's that well-known incident when I think there's a Gujarat, in Gujarat, there's a Gujarati lady who had invited Prabhupada for uh, for the house for person and the family had invited. And they had cooked nice food. Uh, I don't know how to go to this. It was North India somewhere. So then, they had cooked with onion and garlic in it. 
And then Prabhupada, the devotee said, Prabhupada, there's onion in this. And Prabhupada said, there's no onion in this. Prabhupada said, no, there is onion. Prabhupada said, there is no onion in this. There is onion here. Prabhupada again, there is no onion in this. And Prabhupada just took that food. And Prabhupada took that food and then all the devotees of Prabhupada taking the Prabhupada took that. They all took the food. And then, when the devotees went back, Prabhupada told them that in Indian culture, if a sadhu comes to your house and the sadhu refuses your food, it's considered to be like a disaster for the family. So he said, it is our mistake, we did not tell them that we don't take onion garlic. So Prabhupada took that food at that time. Now this is not meant that we should anyway take onion garlic any time. <laughs> that is not the point here. The point is uh, not licentiousness about the rule. It is a sensitivity in applying the rule. So if we are, if say, suppose there is a Ganesh Atuldashi and somebody offers us some Ganesh Modak. Now that's once a year, that's a festival. If if throughout the year all our meals we are taking prasad and one little morsel of something we take how much of a problem is it going to be and if we don't take it if it's a social gathering where everybody is taking and we say i don't take this it can unnecessarily create a lot of trouble so basically we have to have Prabhupada writes in the 10th can 10th chapter bhagavad purport intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective. To see things in their proper perspective means to understand which rule is how important. And okay, this rule is important. We want to take prasad. We want, but, but how important is that rule? Is the rule of taking prasad so important that you know, we can just uh, hurt people's sentiments? Now, of course, this doesn't mean that every time people offer us some food is not offered, we'll take it. No, but there are certain times when we have to act upon time, place, circumstances. So we don't want to become casual about our principles, but at the same time we don't have to be fanatical about our principles. So that, that balance that comes when we have a sense of perspective. The perspective means what is more important, what is less important. In some situations, if it's just we are going along in a train and somebody off on a plane and somebody that person offers us a mother, we may say no. You just give some reason and not take it. But if it's a close family gathering where there are people with whom we are going to relate regularly, at that time saying no can create a whole storm in our social circles. Then why do that at that time? So that sense of perspective comes when we are clear about what is more important and what is less important. So with it on the same point over here, hmm. Saying Krishna devotee should not accept it, or like, like in the sense, in reality, I'm saying that it's just uh, something which we have to decide practically. Not saying you if you're alone or something, somebody gave to your home or something. Yeah, we can take it and we can honor it later, or we can give it to somebody else, or we take it a little bit. It doesn't. It it's it's not a catastrophe. It's not. It doesn't have to be like a fanatical principle that I will ne I will die, but I will not take this. It's not like that. It's, it's whatever is required at that time, we do it. It's, if we can avoid it gracefully, that is good. But if it's going to cause a lot of disruption, then just do the needful over there. Okay. Oh, one, one last question. If you don't yeah. And with respect to this, again, there is no, see these are, I would say there are principles and there are preferences. Some devotees may feel oh, food is so important. And this is what shapes my consciousness. They may be very, very rigid about the rule. We can respect their firmness. But whether we have to follow that firmness in our life, that is something which we have to see. Based on our nature, our relationships, our priorities. So we don't have to... In Bhakti, there are principles and there are, there are preferences. So the principle, I would say, if, if we consider a big continuum, from the level of eating food which is which is you know, the seeds are sown the grains are sown by devotees harvested by devotees transported by devotees cooked by devotees offered by devotees and honored by devotees hmm. you could say that is the highest standard down to the standard where it, the food is vegetarian and we offer it in our mind to krishna and take it this is a continuum 
the higher we are on this it's good but all of this is acceptable but if somebody takes meat that's that's a sperm no so so now in this continuum where who wants to stay that we could say the higher is purer yes that's fine but we are not just living in isolation somewhere we are living in a community and then we have to see what works best within the community that we are living in uh, the devotee community is a broader, broader community so we don't want to go below this level hmm? definitely not but in this where we are that that is a matter of we want to be as high at level possible but at a practical level it is a certain situations it's okay to do certain things okay so from my following question is uh, you said like uh, should we talk one to one through or you tell me whenever to stop okay. it's 10 10 5 i have a question too yeah this is a little bit important for all of us you are a sports person okay okay yeah so you said that right like every person is very very important to lit that small fire and once you lit that small fire and connect to krishna then the like like the whole thing mm-hmm. right? so my question is like lot of devotees are very capable like you know they have very good spiritual life chanting and doing services but however they're not coming for to lit that fire of doing extra step where like go preaching or something because just buried with their own personal lives or like their own sadhana and things like that so i want to know how important is that going the extra step of lighting that fire okay and so preaching yeah. or something like that some devotees may be just caught in their own sadhana or in their personal lives and they may they don't really go out of their way to connect with others yeah. and and how important is it to preach shri prabhupada did tell us that preaching is a part of our sadhana so i would say that we don't separate the two if somebody is strict somebody is strong about the sadhana then he presented it that sharing krishna bhakti is also a part of our sadhana so yes japa is a sadhana study satsang sadhya is a sadhana puja is a sadhana but then prachar is also a part of a sadhana so if we see it that way then it's more inclusive now having said that different devotees have different natures and some devotees like to go out and meet new people and have some sense of adventure in meeting new people and getting people to become devotees some devotees may be of a more nature where they folk they need some sense of order and stability in their lives for some people order and stability means boredom same old thing again and again but for some people it's uh, for those people for some people order and stability is actually what brings security there gives perspective okay i'll do this then i'll do this and then i'll do this and for them n- adventure and exploration seems like too much this may go wrong that may go wrong. what how what we can think about so even within the realm of preaching we could have teaching and we could have preaching preaching means we are going out to new people where we meet different kinds of people and people have different kinds of questions and we may have different kinds of situations but we could have teaching where we have something like bhakti shastri we have devotee cultivation programs there the really more structure more order and people also know more or less the etiquette and the culture people don't ask suddenly wayward questions so that is also actually deepening the culture so we can find our place where we can share krishna bhakti so not everybody has to literally go out and talk with new people necessarily if they can that's wonderful but we have to find out our place by which we can share krishna bhakti okay thank you Yeah, last question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. <coughs> uh, my question is again on uh, Rama and Prabhuji. Uh, uh, I hear mixed opinion about Ram Charit Manas in his con. Uh, I did some research where you know Prabhupad did some lecture also on uh, Ram Charit Manas based on verses of Ram Charit Manas. He spoke high about Tulsi Dasi. But at the same time, I hear other people saying that no, Prabhupad actually rejected and didn't uh, uh, accept okay. Ram Charit Manas. Mm. 
So, what was Prabhupada's position on Ramcharit Manas? There are mixed opinions about this. Yes. I saw one, there was a seminar in Mayapur where a devotee was talking about how there are cultural wars in our movement. So he says that you may have seen these images of uh, these Roman warriors. They have big weapons fighting each other. And their weapons are colliding with like a mace or something. The handle with a big heavy object attached to it. So it was like two people fighting against each other, their maces hitting heavily against each other. Both the maces have written Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said. <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually, we have to understand that following the tradition is not just a matter of uh, finding a quote and then sticking to that what that quote says. <laughs> Is that's important but we can all find quotes to support what we want to say but following rather than thinking of tradition as like this is one line and this is what the tradition is we say follow Shri Prabhupada yes follow Shri Prabhupada but Prabhupada in America and Prabhupada in India was very different Prabhupada when he preached in America different in the sense that the way he preached was in America at that time preaching meant Whoever became connected, they moved in the temple and they left everything. They just became monks or even if they married, they were staying in the temple. But in India, <coughs> Prabhupada preached, most of his preaching was making people life members. That means they were not even committing to chanting a fixed number of rounds. But Prabhupada would go to their houses, encourage them, speak some good words and connect them with Krishna. So we can, if we consider like a pyramid, Prabhupada accepted people who were at the top of the pyramid, very devoted to Krishna, full-time sadhana. And Prabhupada accepted people who had general devotional attitude, a favorable disposition. You know, they were way down on the pyramid. Prabhupada accepted both of them. Today, most of our movement exists between these two levels. We are not a temple-based movement, but we are not even a life member-based movement. We are a congregation-based movement. So the dynamics of the demography has changed and has, has changed enormously in today's world. So that's why we can anybody can find a quote for quote of Prabhupada to support their opinion. So what we have to see more than quotes of Prabhupada is the purpose of Prabhupada. What was Prabhupada's purpose? It was to help us become Krishna conscious. And we have to see how Krishna conscious, you could say Ram conscious, spiritually conscious, devotionally conscious. So we have to see what helps whom to become Krishna conscious, or become spiritually conscious. Now, there's no doubt that the Ram Charit Manas has inspired generations of intense Ram Bhakti in people. In, the, in North India especially, we have this uh, Ram Darbar and Ram Katha and it's it's mostly almost based on Ram Charit Manas. So as far as infusing spiritual consciousness, it has it has been tremendously potent. Mm. And there are several quotes of Shri Prabhupada where he does appreciate his Sritul Siddhas was a great great devotee of Ram and he has composed Ram Charit Manas. And in that sense, it's not to say that Prabhupada rejected Ram Charit Manas. That is a very strong statement. And what Prabhupada said is, and there are most of the places Prabhupada respects Ramcharit Tulsidas, respects Tulsidas, Prabhupada quotes Tulsidas, Prabhupada quotes Ramcharit Manas also as a source in his writings. There are a few statements where Prabhupada seems to seems to disapprove of Ramcharit Manas. So he one place he says there's a tinge of Mayavad in it. Another he says. Valmiki's Ramayana is the original Ramayana. Ramcharit Manas has come later. So Prabhupada's point was that two things I would say. He was writing to his disciples who were very very new. They just come to India. If you see the context of the letter, I think the letter was in 1971 or something. 
the devotee is only four five years old in Krishna consciousness at that time, and these were Western devotees who had no knowledge of Krishna bhakti at all. So Prabhupada's focus at that time was read read the books which he has written for them. Most of the devotees in five years, Prabhupada they had not written all read of all of Prabhupada's books, only mm-hmm. some of Prabhupada's books. So Prabhupada says focus on the focus on the books that literature that we have with us. Uh, was it that he would not want his devotee his followers to read other books? No, not like that. Prabhupada, he gave us the bhakti tradition, which is far bigger and far great, far longer than Prabhupada's own life. Prabhupada gave us the whole bhakti tradition. The first canto, first chapter, it's Prabhupada writes that we should read the previous acharyas' commentaries in the Bhagavatam also, and he gives a list of acharyas. Some of them are not even in Asamprada. Here he says we should read Vallabha's commentary. Now Vallabhacharya's commentary is significant in some, some ways different from Chakravartipad's commentary. So Prabhupada is recommending reading the tradition also. So his statements on Ramcharitmanas are to be seen in the context in which he has spoken them. As far as the tinge of Mayavad is concerned, you could say that that is there even in the Bhagavatam. At the end of the Rama and the Bhagavatam, at the end of the Rama and in the Bhagavatam, which is briefly there in two chapters, it says in this way, Lord Ram put his enter, put his foot on the put his feet in the hearts of his devotees and entered into the Jyoti. Atma Jyoti Agdha. Now what does it mean entered into the Jyoti? Is it like immersion with the impersonal Brahman? It would seem like that. Even the Bhishma pastime, it is said that in this way, after offering prayers to Krishna in his presence, Bhishma became silent and he he merged to the infinity. That's that's the, that's the little Sanskrit. Then Prabhupada also translates it like that, more or less. Now, what is it we merge into the infinity? Is it necessary to refer to impersonal Brahman? Not necessarily. Acharya is good example like a green bird enters into a green tree; it disappears from our view. It appears with us merged. So the, if somebody wants to look for traces of Mayavad, they can be found in the Bhagavatam also. So we don't have to go on a campaign for generally when Prabhupada has made different statements on a particular issue. There is no need to absolutize one statement. We don't have to go on a campaign for the Ram Charitmanas. Say, oh, this is just a work, this is such a great work of devotion. Everybody should read it. No, we have our tradition, we have our books. And even if you read the Ramayana, better read Valmiki Ramayana first. That's the original Ramayana. But we don't have to go on a campaign against it also. If somebody is already attracted to Ramcharitmanas, for years and years, hearing Ramcharitmanas has infused devotion for them, some devotion for Ram, very strong devotion also. We don't have to go against it, kind of campaign against it. We have to focus on the purpose. So for us, if we are going to speak Ram Katha, say in North India or among North Indians, at that time ignorance of Valmiki Ram of Ram Manas or criticism of Ram Manas, it's not going to work. We'll alienate people. But if we ourselves want to study about Ram, first study Valmiki Ram. We don't have to, as I said, don't go for campaign against it or campaign for it. Focus on the purpose of helping, helping ourselves to become Krishna conscious and helping others to become Krishna conscious. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Bhatta Vrinda ki jai. Gaur Premanande. Oh,